History is all well and good, but how does the game play? Glad I asked. You control a number of districts dependent on if you have an officer unopposed there. This is color-coded for your convenience. Blue for the Continental Army, red for the British Army, green for Patriot militias, and pink-ish, I guess, for British Tories or Loyalists. The militias and Loyalists consist of officers and regiments that are allied to the Americans and British, respectively, but aren't under direct control of the player. FYI, that can get very annoying at times. It's in managing these districts where most of the important gameplay occurs. It's not sexy, and perhaps a little clunky, but this is where you'll need to put on your big boy britches and wade in. The district status screen gives you a quick overview of how things are shaking with your regiment. You'll have not one, but two pages of vital stats, including number of troops, cash, food, and equipment on hand. Not to mention the ever-important support of the populace. Keep an eye on this. If it drops, your ability to defend the region will falter, and could have repercussions in support all the way up to the national government, which will happily take a vote to yank your ass if they don't like the job you're doing. On the other side of the screen, you have your menu. This is every option available to your officer presented in general categories, which open up into more specific commands. Domestic deals with sending or borrowing supplies and gaining the support of the citizenry either through a military parade or the much more useful propaganda pamphlet. Materials is where you can buy any of the supplies your army needs to survive, like food and gunpowder, or build equipment like cannons. Personnel has to do with actions directly involving your officer, such as bonuses or furlough, allied officers, recruiting them to follow your command, or enemy officers, bribing them to defect. Military is where the meat of this game happens. You can draft soldiers and train them, move your regiment to another district, or wage an attack against an adjacent enemy. Rounding out the district screen is the ever-popular info menu. Here you can spy on the enemy, or look in depth at the stats of your officer, district, state, or governmental body, either the Continental Congress or House of Commons. The latter is important since these guys control your purse strings and can gather more help for you if you have sufficient support amongst the representatives. But sometimes that's easier said than done. <sighs> Why you always gotta be a troublemaker, Rhode Island? The important thing to note about your officer's commands in the district is that each one uses up the body stat. Much like a semen sample, it's essentially a measure of how much spunk that officer has to get the job done. It regenerates a little bit with each passing turn, but you're going to want to keep an eye on it. If your officer runs too low on body, he can't perform the simplest of actions. Some of the other stats, such as reputation and loyalty, make commands, such as the Gazette, more effective. But most every other stat on each officer comes into play during battles. But I'll talk about those later. <laughs> so concerning battles, each district has a unique layout that at least somewhat resembles the part of the country it's from. For example, in Boston, the Charles River is pretty well represented, and in western Pennsylvania, expect a lot of mountains in your path. As you'd expect, different tiles on the map allow for different movements. Grass is grass, no issues there. Forests are nigh impenetrable, which is funny considering you'd intuitively swap the attributes for forests and mountains, but I guess the designers wanted to convey the difficulty in leading an army through the thick colonial American wilderness. Water can only be crossed with a boat, unless it's shallow, and craggy mountains are impassable. Towns and forts are also scattered around to boost the defending army's chances in a fight. You can launch a battle with multiple officers. This is important because each officer only controls one type of regiment. There is your standard infantry all the way through guerrillas, cavalry, engineers, and fleets of ships. Each of these units have special commands available to them that you need to master in order to plan an effective strategy. For example, you could have some infantry lure enemies into an ambush from your guerrillas, who can not only move through forests, but hide in them. This means they can slip the Brits a little bit of an Alabama Hot Pocket, if you know what I mean. The simple graphics in these battles belie the surprising depth to every action you take, and I would say that this game provides one of the most satisfying strategic battle systems that 16-bit consoles had to offer. In fact, the strategic options and fun in this game actually remind me a lot of one of the great underappreciated NES games, North and South. Though it's outside my chosen field of criticism, I'd love to recommend it as a review for the happy video game nerd. But he hasn't responded yet to the sweater I sent him that's made for my own hair. No? 
Not that hair. However, all this gushing over the gameplay leads me to some gripes. First off, let's talk sound. The effects are done well, but this is perhaps the only game I've reviewed so far where the music simply isn't that great. I mean, it's okay and sufficiently period specific, but let's face it, hearing the same two minute loop of anything for hours on end while you're trying to figure out how much powder to buy for General Knox's artillery will get a bit grating. I'd suggest muting the TV and instead putting on your favorite record. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, for the 20-somethings out there, a record is like a big CD. Oh, and uh, for the teenagers, a CD is like an MP3 player that only holds a dozen songs. And spins. On the positive side, I like the graphics quite a bit. I wouldn't call them stunning, but they serve their purpose well. You won't be confused at what you're looking at on the battlefield, status screen icons are fairly obvious as to their meanings, and the cartoonish depictions of Revolutionary War figures and events immerse you in the story instead of making you rely completely on your imagination. And let's face it, we don't play video games to exercise our imaginations. That's what Legos are for. But the biggest problem with this game is that the controls are clunky. Very clunky. That's not really the fault of the developers, it's just a limitation of a system that's controlled with a controller instead of a mouse and keyboard. Even Civilization on the Super Nintendo suffered from this limitation. As any strategic gamer can tell you, PC is the platform of choice for quick and easy game management. Koei tried to mitigate this with options like mappable hotkeys and the ability to give the computer command of far-flung districts, but there's only so much they could do. Moving half a dozen regiments across the battlefield can take a while, and be especially trying at times, which is why you'll likely turn off animations after your first couple playthroughs. But if you have the patience, you will be rewarded. And if you don't have the patience, well, there's no shame in playing the DOS version. After the tubes warm up, it's pretty stable, as long as you don't use cheap coal and keep the steam supply steady. And on top of that, I need to warn you, this game has a steep learning curve. This isn't Pong we're talking about here, it's the freaking American Revolution. Balancing dozens of officers, regions, and regiments require no small amount of micromanaging. But really, if you just jump in and play a practice game or two, you'll get the hang of things. I think most any simulation addict will latch onto this game. Any good sim worth its salt will make you forget about the passage of time and neglect your family. This one's no different. The fun core is still there even if you have to make your way past the time-consuming Outer Rhine to get to it. So that's Liberty or Death, a great game that's worth a look despite an antiquated interface. Now, I've been on a roll lately by reviewing games that are available for Wii's Virtual Console. Unfortunately, that's not the case here. Luckily, this game came out for the Super Nintendo, Genesis, and yes, even DOS platforms. So it's not too rare, and you can find it for a reasonable price on eBay. So chin up, Sim fans. Though your native habitat may be the PC, for years now there have been great strides into the world of consoles. And with a little bit of effort, you can reap the benefits of your forebears. The funny thing is that as a kid, I had little appreciation for the intricacies of this rich game. But now I have the attention span to... Washington, Washington, six foot twenty, fucking killing for fun. Spread, spread, Delaware, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Sue me if I go too fast, but the sons of his opponents wish that he was their dad. Got a wig for his wig, got a brain for his heart. He'll kick you apart, he'll kick you apart. Ooh, he'll save children, but not the British children. Fuck the shit out of bears Threw a knife into heaven And could kill with a stare He made love like an eagle Falling out of the sky Killed his sensei in a duel And he never said why Washington, Washington Twelve stories high Made of radiation The present beware The future beware He's coming, he's coming, he's coming What you do to die today in a minute or two to two?
I think distinctly hard to say, but hard to still do without beat tattoo or twenty tattoo or rat tattoo. And the dragon will come when he hears it. Dominant minute or two to do today. A minute or two to do.